I'm Thomas Mann, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And I'm uh, Norm Ornstein, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, and we are co-authors of the New York Times best-selling book, It's Even Worse Than It Looks, How the American Constitutional System Collided with the New Politics of Extremism. I think I would uh, say the book is a, an attempt to provide a different interpretation of the widespread malaise about America's dysfunctional politics and to offer some suggested remedies to it. Uh, we believe uh, that most of the commentary uh, in the media and among pundits outside uh, bipartisan groups, uh, a lot of academics is, uh, is inaccurate. It doesn't really get to the heart of the problems we're facing. And ironically, uh, those misinterpretations serve, we think, to misinform and demobilize a public, uh, which, uh, which is the only force that can really ameliorate the problems our politics face. Let, let me uh, uh, add to that by going back to the genesis of this book. Uh, Tom and I have uh, been working together uh, on uh, analyzing and studying American politics, especially but not exclusively Congress. Uh, for 40 years, uh, even a little bit more. And uh, we've collaborated in a number of projects to try to both monitor and improve different elements of the political system, internally in Congress, election reform, uh, uh, problems with the permanent campaign and governance, campaign finance, ethics, and a whole series of other areas. And we've written a number of books together uh, on elements of this subject. The most recent before this one in 2006 uh, called The Broken Branch, How Congress is Failing America and How to Get It Back on Track. Uh, in that one, we lament a Congress that has gone off the rails, um, not doing any oversight, uh, not fulfilling its fundamental responsibilities. Um, we put a lot of blame on Republicans who took over uh, the reins of power while they had a president but behaved in a more supine fashion uh, instead of being an independent branch. But we also uh, faulted Democrats plenty for their uh, era in the majority. Um, six years passed. We did, a, in the meantime, an update uh, of the book after the Democrats recaptured control, saying that things were a little bit better, but uh, this was far from a, a cured branch. Uh, and then uh, an editor who had worked with us originally on The Broken Branch, called uh, and said, uh, don't you think it's time to uh, do something uh, that would uh, bring the political process up to date? And after some thought about whether we could uh, actually fit it in, given our time commitments, we both decided that we wanted to go ahead and do it, and do it on an expedited fashion, and drop a lot of other things, because we were increasingly alarmed at what had happened in the political process. Things that were bad in 2006, modestly but not wonderfully better in 2008, had taken a very serious turn for the worse. And uh, a Congress which at one point captured a 9% approval rating uh, showed that the American public uh, was at least as unhappy as we were and happened to be on target. So we wanted to do something that was broader than just looking at Congress, uh, that looked at the culture more generally uh, that had been corroded uh, and uh, uh, really uh, devastated uh, more broadly, but also in politics, uh, look at many different elements of the process, and that would pull no punches. And uh, that's the result that we got. It was not an easy book to write for us because uh, we have tried meticulously to be straightforward, cast blame where it belongs. But uh, we retain a lot of friends on both sides, and we're not seen as partisans in any way. We're still not. We haven't changed. But in this case, uh, saying where blame lay uh, meant putting a lot more of it on the Republican Party, uh, which we call in this book 
and insurgent outlier. Well, I think uh, implicit in your question is, uh, is a model of, uh, of crossfire. That is, the route to truth is, is, uh, is through the confrontation of opposing ideological uh, viewpoints. Uh, uh, we actually reject that and think that's a perverse aspect of our politics. Uh, uh, Norm and I disagree on, on, on matters uh, occasionally, uh, but we agree on much more. We were both trained at the University of Michigan. We have our PhDs from there. We, we came to Washington at the same time. We had a chance to work inside the Congress for a year. We're, we're, we're both deeply respectful of our constitutional system. We've spent a good deal of our careers explaining and defending uh, that system uh, and talking about the importance of uh, the first branch of, uh, of government. Well, I think it. I think it really does. And and to look to look for contrast is 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 probably to to sort of mischaracterize uh, who we are and what we do. We've we've worked together on a dozen projects uh, in the past. Uh, uh, it they've all tended to be how can we better understand how our political institutions are working and not working, and what are the avenues for improving those institutions. That's what characterizes us. I think it's also the case that Norm and I had each developed very unusual careers. We, we have one foot in Washington in the policy and political world, and the other foot in academe. Uh, uh, Norm has been a full-time professor. I've never had, but I was quite active in other ways in the in the scholarly community, and and so that's what's distinctive about our our partnership. Uh, I mean, if you look at our writings before we came together to collaborate, I probably wrote more on congressional elections uh, early on. That was that was my initial. Focus. Norm wrote more on on decision making within the Congress itself and the early reform movements. So we've, but I think on every chapter uh, in this book, uh, one of us took the lead in drafting part or all of it, and the other then rewrote it in in some ways. But you couldn't say, well, this is Norm's chapter and that's Tom's chapter. Let, let me uh, uh, offer a couple of uh, sort of twists on this. Uh, one is uh, this book got an enormous amount of resonance when it first came out, and uh, it was kind of amusing because there were a number of liberal blogs, left-wing blogs, uh, that complained that they'd been saying uh, similar things for years and nobody paid any attention. So how come now this gets attention? And I think uh, we believe a good part of the reason is that together we've spent 40 years building up capital as people who don't start with an ideological or a partisan uh, edge. And uh, saying this caught people's attention. So that's one part of it. The second part that makes the book distinctive uh, is not only that we provide some historical grounding and perspective, but also half the book is about where do we go from here. Uh, it starts with something that is not usually done in these cases, uh, which we call a chapter we call bromides to be avoided, things not to do. But then we go into some detail on a whole host of areas where changes might occur. Uh, it's easy to throw up your hands and say, uh, this is horrible or the end of the world is uh, coming. Um, it's harder to look at what you can do about it. Now, we do this with a uh, healthy dose of uh, reality and some skepticism. This is not something where there's a, a quick fix uh, or where there's some panacea. You can turn a switch and all is going to be better, partly because 
it's deeply embedded in the culture now. And what we have is a tribal politics where the country is divided into tribes. And in some ways, that's getting worse. The nature of this presidential election, uh, you know, here we are uh, in August. Uh, we're doing this right around the time of the Republican convention. And we now have uh, a couple of striking things uh, this week. Uh, one is uh, what uh, Romney uh, advisors are talking about much more openly, which is if the, while they're not abandoning the idea of focusing on the economy, they're turning to a sharper cultural attack on Obama, and that's going to provide uh, an even further division. We have a lot of political science research that shows that ads on welfare, for example, tap into racial resentments. And uh, if the ads themselves, as Ezra Klein of the Washington Post suggests, are not overtly uh, racial in nature, uh, they have that effect, and that's why they're running them. The second is a comment made by uh, the Romney pollster, uh, Neil Newhouse, um, which is just absolutely striking. Uh, as uh, he said, uh, our campaign is not going to be bound by fact checkers. Uh, so facts mean nothing now. And, uh, of course, it's been kind of amusing because uh, Governor Romney himself lamented what's happened and said, you know, if there are ads that fact checkers say are false, they should be taken off the air. But apparently that means their ads and not ours. If you live in a world and a culture where lying is celebrated, um, changing some of the structures uh, is uh, not going to be enough. It's, it sounds inviting to pick <laughs> up on, but I don't think that's, uh, that's the case uh, at all. Uh, neither of us is an ideologue, uh, but ideologues are driving our politics right now, so it isn't clear to me that the success the two of us might have coming together and working on this, uh, even though we come from two institutions that out there in the real world have a reputation uh, uh, as, as being divided ideologically. Uh, uh, in, in reality, uh, we don't well represent uh, the, the, the political world. Norm was talking about this before with the ads uh, running and, and the absence of truth value to much of what is what is being said, and his examples uh, came from the Republican side. That was not an accident. Uh, uh, one of the assertions in our volume is that the parties, while neither are angels, is an angel, uh, 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 differ really quite a bit on this. I mean, the, the respect for appreciation of facts, evidence, science, is, is much more rooted in the Democratic Party than the Republican Party. Um, uh, there is a contempt for, uh, for much of the scientific enterprise and really a contempt for what has evolved as our policy regime over a century, really going back to Teddy Roosevelt and a a determination to turn it around. There's a, a new interpretation of what the Constitution means, of how it was divinely inspired. Um, there are a whole, sort of whole host of uh, bits of uh, evidence that, that suggest in that respect, as well as in other respects, uh, the Republican Party today doesn't fulfill the expectation that we have about our two major parties that operate right of center and left of center, but basically in the mainstream of American politics. We, we don't have a conservative party anymore. We, we have a, a center left party and a radical party, and there's nothing conservative about uh, that radical Republican party. Yeah, I, that's, I think, a very key point. Our book is not a celebration of liberalism or even center-left politics, or even center-right politics. It's really a look at uh, and a lament at what's happened to problem-solving. 
You know, the Broken Branch, we dedicated to uh, two great uh, lawmakers, Barbara Conable, who was a quite conservative Republican from New York, and uh, Pat Moynihan, uh, who was an iconoclastic but basically liberal uh, Democrat uh, in the Senate from New York. And we dedicated to them because they were not only just wonderful human beings, but their goal in coming to public service was to solve problems, and that meant you looked to build coalitions, and you looked at facts, and you looked across lines. Uh, we uh, got a, a ringing endorsement of this book from Chuck Hagel uh, of Nebraska, a longtime senator who was a very conservative lawmaker. We've gotten a lot of praise from Mickey Edwards, uh, who served in the House for 16 years and was chairman of the American Conservative Union. We use, an, as an example, Bob Inglis, a very conservative uh, Republican from South Carolina who lost in a primary uh, because uh, he was not willing to say that Barack Obama was a socialist pig, um, but who's now gone out and formed an organization from a very distinctly free market viewpoint on what to do about climate change that starts with an understanding that it's a serious problem. And he's being vilified by a lot of people. The, the big difficulty that we have is, I think, twofold. One, it's become tribal. So it's not what the idea is, it's who's expressing it. And you see that very clearly in the uh, health care debate um, where uh, we have a Republican convention that is going to just slam Obamacare as socialism and a government takeover of health care um, when it is extremely close to what Romney has not only uh, uh, been behind in uh, Massachusetts, but now apparently is getting back uh, to uh, saying positive things about, along with a Republican alternative to the Clinton plan in uh, 1994. This is not a single-payer system or even a, a public option, so it's, it's because he's behind it. Uh, and at the same time, uh, if you are a problem solver, if your goal is to find solutions, and that means working across party lines, in today's Congressional Republican Party, and it's true in state legislatures in increasing fashion across the country, uh, you are uh, almost certain, first of all, to face a challenge in a primary, probably financed by the Club for Growth, uh, and you'll be vilified and ostracized. That's not the conservative Republican Party that we know from the days of Ronald Reagan uh, or uh, moving forward. It's a very different party, and Tom is, I think, spot on in saying this is not a conservative party. It's a radical one.